Now my grandma used to take me camping when I was a child. I did a girls camp in the summer in the mountains when I was a preteen where my friends and I would often wander off into the woods together. As a child, I played in the woods for hours with my brother. It was always fun and always felt safe and never eerie or creepy. Most of my time in the woods as a child was spent there and it was fun and joyful and adventurous. I'd like to share another story, however, that I had a bad feeling from, and others dismissed us too, but when we were in our 20s, a friend of mine in DC organised a women's survivalist training camp for our female friends, which is probably seven or eight of us, I can't remember exactly. No, I'd never been to West Virginia, but the land was beautiful and the roads were terrible. We had rented a cabin at a campground with multiple cabins on site and during the day now our guide and teacher would take us and show us cool things like local medicinal plants or how to make rope out of milkweed. A West Virginian extended family was having a large reunion at the same time. Two to three of their girls about elementary school age start hovering around our classes. Now. They already knew most of what we're learning. We had a great time in the woods and on the land with no creepiness for the first night. However, on the last night, the owner of the campground had a big bonfire with hot dogs and marshmallows to roast and cider, and everybody who was renting a cabin was invited. It was after dark, and it was either a longish walk or a short drive, and this is on the campground land. So my friend A and I decide to walk. We were having a nice walk and a nice chat when we suddenly got a bad feeling. We both went quiet at the same time and were nonchalant but glanced around to see what we could see. On our right was a cabin that looks deserted. It was totally dark, no lights on, no lantern out, but there was a single spot of light, the red embers of a cigarette burning. We could barely make out the figure of a man sitting there in the dark smoking. We stay quiet but pick up the pace. We checked in with each other once we approached the big house and we're finally in the light of the bonfire. Now that was creepy to us. Had we felt creepy before out there? No, calm and safe. The land hadn't ever felt creepy to us before, but the guy sitting in the dark had given a terrible menacing vibe, even 20 feet away before we saw him. We told some of our friends and they just laughed it off and told us that we'd been afraid for no reason. It was perfectly safe here, they said. He's just another camper, probably with the West Virginian family, and we're just paranoid, they say. Other than that, we had a great time at the bonfire, chatting with other campers and with the owners who are very nice. When it came time to call it a night, the owners offered to drive us back, and A and I happily agreed. Now wanting to avoid, Another walk by the terrible cabin, we got back safely without incident, and the owners wished us good night. Now, our cabin had two levels, the ground floor and a loft level. The ground floor was one big open room with a few beds, and if I recall correctly, a table and chairs and a fridge and maybe a stove. I was on the ground floor with the other three girls, and A was on the left level with the other two three girls at the top. I often have insomnia and I did that night so I just stayed awake in the dark while everybody else fell asleep around me. I was awake for hours just thinking my thoughts until I heard the crunch of gravel outside, like somebody walking on it. I nudged my friend V who was the closest person to me. I say to V there's someone outside but V mumbled and said it's a deer and go back to sleep. So V's no help. I got out of bed and crawled over to the window to see if I could see a deer outside, crunching on gravel. I instead see the red glow of a cigarette and can barely make out the silhouette of two men in the darkness. Now, the two cabins are not close together. They weren't far, but they weren't close. We're on a bend of the camp road where the other cabins aren't. Now, the closest one was a short walk away, but it wasn't like running across the street or next door or anything, and not visible behind the trees and brush. Anyway, 
The closest cabin was far enough away that there was no other reason for two guys to be out there smoking. I nudge V and say there's two guys there and she says it's a deer sleep. Now my boyfriend at the time had basically brought me all of our EI to go on this trip. Our guide had asked us to bring a large knife and had brought a nice hunting knife and also a little camp hatchet. I don't know what I'd been able to do to be honest but I grabbed both and just huddled to the window waiting in the dark. Suddenly a car alarm goes off and all the cars were parked in the front of the house. Groans came saying come on get the alarm off who's that? And I said I think it's mine and found the fob and turned off the alarm. There's silence and we wait. The car alarm goes off again now. The girls lost it and say shut up with your car. Now I finally crawl to V. I say V the guy's out there. I think they're messing with the car of the other girl. And she says it's a deer, go to bed and leave me alone. Okay then, the car alarm goes off again and they shout at her to turn off the car alarm. Now, A eventually comes down the little ladder thing. I went up to her and whisper, A there's two guys out there and no one believes me. They're just saying it's a deer. But I saw them smoking in the back. You can't go out there alone. I'm going out there first with the lantern so at least we can see around the cabin. So we put the shoes on and I turned on the lantern and open the door and walk onto the porch with the lantern in my left hand and hatchet in my right. I hung up the lantern on a little hook on the porch. It was very bright and lit up the whole clearing in front of the cabin and the whole parking lot for the cars. For at least a moment we can't see anyone there. I tentatively walked towards the front door and walked around the car, trying the handles. No alarm went off as she tugs them. See, it wasn't a deer, I said. Even with you trying to get into the car while it was locked, no alarm. Your alarm's not sensitive, someone's trying to get in. We go back into the house and lock the door behind us, turning off the lantern, and sat inside the dark waiting for our eyes to adjust. A told me that she hadn't been able to sleep well and had been lying awake in the dark in the loft feeling uneasy. I told her I wondered if somebody had tried to lure her out there alone in the dark and had been spooked off when the two of us came in with an extremely bright lantern. We then stay there, quietly chatting together in the dark for hours waiting to see if anything else would happen, but the alarm doesn't go off again, and finally, Enough times passed that we decide to go to bed. The car alarm was quiet for the rest of the night. That was our last night there, so in the morning we pack up and I drove back with A. Now, if a zombie apocalypse were to happen, I pick A for my team because she was listening to our gut and worked with me as a team to keep everyone safe. I'll keep this short and sweet, but this happened a few years back. We're having a brutally cold winter. The snow had frozen into ice and covered everything. It was pitch black in the backyard and when I went to let my dogs outside one last time before bed that evening, as we exited the house from the sliding door for the walkout basement and onto the lower deck, I felt that something's off. Our house backs up onto some woods so I was accustomed to hearing noises from wildlife in the night time but this is different. Nothing made a sound except the arctic cold wind, but I had a feeling that I'm being watched. The entire time my dog was in the backyard, I looked around nervously expecting a coyote or some other kind of predator to pop out of the tree line. My dog does his business, but afterwards stopped and stared to the corner of the woods until I actually get scared and call him back inside. He hurries back. I quickly locked the sliding door and shut the curtains, unable to shake the uneasy feeling of which I'm having now. After double and triple checking all the locks in the house, I go to bed. Around 3 in the morning, I now hear the muffled sound of my dog barking from the basement of two floors below. I got up, stumbled down three flights of stairs and found him standing in the basement. He was peeking his head through the closed curtains, barking his head off with the hair standing up all along his back. Now I try calling him away from the door but he won't let up which is weird. 
I tried to peek out the curtain to see what he's barking at after the uneasy feeling I had earlier in the night. Finally, I hold my breath and swipe the curtains aside. I peer into the inky blackness but see nothing to cause alarm, and a wave of relief washes over me. Now I figured that it must have been a deer or raccoon in the yard that set him off. He whined at the door for a few more minutes until I bribed him upstairs with a cookie for dogs. I went back to bed and wasn't disturbed again, that is, until the morning when I went into the basement to let the dog out. I opened the sliding door and walked out onto the deck as he bounded into the snow. My blood ran cold as the sub-zero morning temperatures pierced when I looked down. But there, frozen into the deck, were a set of bare human footprints which are very clear. I can make out each toe on the person's footprint. The prints were large and appeared to be from an adult male. Looking around, I noticed that they started at the deck, went to the sliding door, then towards the basement living room, then disappearing off the side of the deck. I had my snow boots on, so I walked around but couldn't find any other trace of the footprints. Keep in mind, the daily temperatures of around zero, never above it, and the wind chill made it feel close to 20 below. Frostbite would have literally set in within a matter of minutes for anybody out there, especially in the dead of night. Now I've never experienced anything like it since. My father is a park ranger, and even when he was off duty, he still liked to take me on trips out into the great wilderness. We went to quite a few different national parks, but something that I'd like to share with you is a rather strange experience that we had while we went on one camping trip during the summer. Now we were planning to be out here for about four days, and this is during the summer break. It meant that a lot of different places were very busy, but my father, having the career that he did, knew one that would be a very quiet place we could go to, and I was all up for it. At the time, I was doing okay in school, but I didn't really know what I wanted, really. At the time, I was pretty sure I was going to end up in the military, but it didn't happen for a few reasons. But because of this at the time, my dad thought it would be a good idea to take me out into the woods just to get too accustomed to being outside. It made a lot of sense, and obviously you're going to spend time camping out if you're in the military, so it was a pretty good idea, we thought. I did have some summer school things that I needed to do which were coming up, and I really didn't want to do them. I don't know, the idea of summer school just never really made sense to me. The way that I'd look at it is that you're on summer vacation for a reason, and you shouldn't have to do more things in between. I think it should be a time that you can really rest and recover, but my mum didn't think so. Again, I think my dad understood this, and that's why he was quite willing to take me on a nice trip I could enjoy. There's a number of different things we had planned for this particular trip. Now, on the first day we set out just for a nice hike to see the views. We had all of our camping gear with us in some old military rucksack things, my dad carrying the most. Now, during the first day, we saw a couple of people around, but I realised that the further we went, the less and less they would become. Now, this is a good thing for me, because I kind of wanted to escape people a bit. It was a really good experience, and I had a good time bonding with my father over this. Now, eventually it gets closer to nightfall, and we decide that we're going to try some night fishing. It's something that I haven't done before, so I'm quite excited to do so. We eventually make it to the campground that my dad had picked out for us, so I'm pretty happy to be there and put the stuff down. My dad shows me where we can do the fishing and sets up everything and gives me a headlamp. Now, while this is happening, I haven't really done fishing before, so I'm pretty much at a loss as to how exactly I'm supposed to do this, so... Every five minutes that I haven't caught anything, I put my headlamp closer to the water looking for the fish, obviously scaring them off, and I constantly move my fishing reel around thinking that's going to make a difference, but again, it probably just scares them off. I don't know. 
I was more worried about her to my hand on the fishing reel. My dad seems to be gone for quite a while though, but it doesn't really bother me at the time because I'm too caught up in trying to do the fishing. While fishing, I can hear some water disturbance. It's not close, but I definitely notice it, and I face my head up, trying to shine my lamp towards it, but obviously I can't see that far. The torch isn't that powerful. Now, I can just about make out the silhouette of something in the water before it disappears down again, and I think, wow, that must have been a really big fish. Now, something strange that happened while doing so is, out of my peripheral vision, I realise that a plant has just moved like somebody's gone over and touched it. Now again, there's no one around but myself and my dad, and I know it's not my dad, so I'm a little bit unsettled by this. Now, I do think maybe it was just some kind of animal, so I don't think too much of it. I try and cast my fishing reel as far out as I can now. I just about do so, and my dad eventually arrives and says, God son, you know you took me out with that, you have to be careful, and shows me how to do it properly. And my dad's actually doing fishing properly. We didn't eventually find anything, but he tells me not to shine the light down because it scares the fish and that you kind of want to stay still. I tell him that I'm sure there was a large fish that disturbed the waters further up, but he tells me the fish shouldn't be big enough to really do that because I said it was similar to a person, but I think my dad dismisses this. Now it starts to get quite cold, so we head back to our campsite and settle in for the night. And it's a pretty good night. My dad was reading a book, and I wasn't really sure what to do with myself, so I just started drawing some things. It's something I'd done when I was a lot younger. I don't actually do drawing anymore, but I'm pretty good at kind of like the cartoon sketches for some reason. I guess I used to draw The Simpsons and Spongebob or something like that, but I think that's the reason that I have kind of a knack for it. And my dad was pretty impressed with my drawings. I just drew some of the forest and tried to draw the thing that I'd seen in the water earlier. Well, not necessarily the thing, but the way the water was disturbed and the plant moving. It felt like the right thing to do at the time. And that was that. We eventually fall asleep and wake up for the next day. Now on the second day, we weren't actually leaving this spot, and we were just going to do some more hiking around. My dad took me to one place, and my god did it have a beautiful view there. Everything looked so pristine and beautiful, and at the time it cemented into my mind that I wanted to be a military person, because I thought, well, I'm just going to be seeing things like this all the time, and for that I was incredibly excited. Now my grandfather and his grandfather are in the military, we're kind of from a military family so I thought it was going to be good to follow suit. Now, eventually this day comes to a close and nothing too much happened. The following morning we pack up and we're ready to go on to the last part of this, get into the last campsite, the third one. Now the hiking to get to this one wasn't too bad really. And again, I was pretty pleased to go out there. I don't know why, I just felt good the whole time, and it was a lovely experience. Now we get to the campground eventually, and set a whim for the night. And this is when things get a bit weird. I'm awoken by the sight of somebody outside the tent, I can just about see the silhouette. I say dad, and then realise he's not there, and I quickly unzip the tent, I can see my dad holding the hunting knife and torch in the other pointing at someone. I say, Dad, Dad. And he says, To stay still, son. And my dad screams at somebody to get back now. Because of how bright it is, and obviously I've just come out of the dark tent, my eyes haven't adjusted, but I quickly go and grab my headlamp and turn that on. And I can see somebody covered in blood there holding a knife, just staring at me and my dad. Now, what was really crazy is what happened next. He turns round, throws himself into a tree, then gets up again, and repeats the process. He stares at us for probably 10 seconds before going up to the exact same tree near our campsite, throwing himself at it, then coming back again. I realise that he's dropped a knife and constantly picks it up, and he hasn't cut himself, and the blood and stuff is just from the tree. 
but what on earth is he doing? Now this gone on for a good 10 minutes before my dad tells me to start packing up everything. I quickly do so, and I didn't feel too scared in this moment because having my dad there with his knife made me feel like the safest person in the world. Now, we eventually get all of our stuff together, and I kid you not, the whole time this guy was constantly doing the same thing over and over again. I've never seen anything like it, and not even to this day I haven't. We eventually get our stuff together, and my dad tells me to hold his hand and to lead the way back. Now, this is a big responsibility at the time, because I haven't really been camping like this before, and I'm not certain I know the way back, but my dad tells me that he's not going to look back until this guy is out of sight. Now, I do constantly glance back, and my dad tells me not to because he can see when I'm doing it because of the light, and he knows how scared I can get sometimes. But I asked my dad what's happening, and he said that the guy's constantly doing this same thing over and over again, until eventually we're at a point where my dad can take over and tells me to do the same. My dad's walking incredibly quick, and eventually we make it back. My dad quickly makes a call to the police and reports what's happening. I'm confused as heck, and eventually we get back into the car and drive home. Now it turns out that what happened, and this is something I only learnt after my dad told me after a number of years, is that the police found that guy there. Apparently, he had stabbed somebody and then taken some kind of mushroom that gives you a repetitive motion syndrome or whatever it's called. And that's why he was throwing himself at the tree. Apparently he was completely out of his mind, but they managed to capture him. Now if it wasn't for that mushroom making him repeat his motions, he could have easily continued to progress towards us and probably just stabbed us in our tent. But thank god he didn't. In 2020, my mum, 60s female, and I, 30s female, decided to go on an overnight camping trip together on the Oregon coast. I picked what looked like a pretty campsite from a campsite app and we went off. When we got there, we realised it's right off the highway, but there were enough trees and a fence up that you couldn't really see the road, but the gate was just a metal gate that swung into place with no locks. There was a house on either side, but the property was fenced in on both sides. We pitched a tent pretty far back close to the woods on the property. The closest house was about 100 yards away, and the highway was about 200 yards. But then again, it was mostly fenced in and surrounded by firs. It's a lovely campsite, and my mum raved about how beautiful the place was. I will say that I got a feeling of dread as soon as we walked onto the property, but we arrived late, and I didn't know we'd be able to get a new spot quickly. My mum could tell I was nervous, but for some reason, I put her enjoyment of the beauty of the campsite over my feeling of dread. We made a nice campfire and enjoyed some hot chocolate as we watched the fire. I keep an eye out and didn't see or hear anything too odd. I I R C. My mum went to bed before I did, and stayed up and watched as the fire for a long time before going to bed. Finally, I tuck in very exhausted from staying up. At about 2am, I awoke to twig snapping and what sounded like somebody dragging their fingers on the side of the tent. Up to the front, I sat up, grabbed the phone and the only weapon I had, a flashlight, and unzipped my sleeping bag in case I need to fight anyone. There was a full moon that night and I couldn't tell if it was a person's shadow falling on the tent or if a tree branch shadow was moving from the wind. It sounded like there's two people outside trying their best to be quiet. We had brought our books and boots inside and there was no indicator of anybody being out there. It felt like they were trying to gauge the tent that I was in while listening for what they were. I had made sure to make enough noise so they knew somebody inside was alert, but no more than that. If they knew someone is awake, they can't surprise us, but they also don't know who is inside or whether we have guns or not. 
I sat there in the dark until dawn. My mum slept through the whole thing. When we got off and out of the tent, small things had been moved. Our camp chairs had cup holders. One cup had been in the cup holder, which was on the ground. A pen that had been in a cup holder was also on the ground now. My mum raves about how good her sleep was and how refreshing it was to camp there, so I didn't want to burst her bubble or scare her. We packed off and I didn't tell her, but let her have a nice memory of deep rest and relaxation while camping on this beautiful property. Was it someone living in the woods? Someone walking down the highway in the middle of the night, or God knows who? My mum got a great experience and I got a refund and a fear of camping. The property owner said that they might actually set up cameras now just to keep an eye on things for the future. Now it's really the people out there that scare me more than anything. I don't like the way that they're acting so misconspicuously and trying their best not to be heard. That's what creeps me out and why would they go through our stuff? I work as a childcare professional and one of the kids that I look after had recently gotten into hiking. I decided to take him into a really cool trail in the Salt Fork State Park. We were all set up to hike to the Hoss Cave after parking right near the beginning of the trailhead. The entire trail was about half a mile, which is why I say I chose the trail for our hike that day. I also chose this trail because any time that I had been on it before, it was busy and full of people and a very popular site which makes me feel very secure. However, this past summer, we had a cluster of seven summer storms which causes massive damage to the trail, so to my surprise, it was much more difficult and completely empty. I wasn't bothered by the trail being obviously empty because there was a small construction crew working on a bridge that was just barely visible from the trailhead. He was still up for the hike, despite the entire width of the trail being washed out until it was no more than a foot or so wide with a 6 foot to 12 foot drop off into a creek bed. There's then a solid rock and several miles of trees. Now he's very athletic and I was confident in his abilities if he was and he was so excited to tackle our adventure. We made it all the way to the platform that allows you to see the entire cave. Now there's many trees which are surrounding the platform and it was actually closed at this point but we made it this far and we decided to maneuver around the platform and proceed a few hundred feet into the cave. We spent the most time in this area due to the difficulty, so I knew exactly what it looks like. There were tree roots directly under the platform and you could climb down on either side of them. It's also worth noting that the cave is much more like a cliff with an overhanging rock formation and a trickle of water directly in the middle. It's not a creepy closed up cave, it's very open and beautiful. We got to the cave and I noticed a candle that was not burning recently but had been at some point sitting on a large rock and had a heart caved into it. I chalked it up to somebody having a date or something and disregarding it. He wanted to climb to the top when I noticed two more candles and three stacks of small rocks that had been stacked up by someone. It definitely felt weird at this point, but it was about this time that he found a small puddle full of baby salamanders and wanted to catch them. It was the happiest that I've seen him in a very long time and I didn't have the heart to tell him that we have to go. We spent about an hour catching baby salamanders and I've watched him have the time of his life. We finally decide to leave and when we got to the platform, Dead centre in the middle of the tree roots was a wet washcloth hanging in there, which was absolutely not there before. He noticed it as well, but didn't pick up on the severity of the situation of which we're in. At that moment, I actually knew two things. One, someone's watching us, and we didn't see them. And two, they were potentially hiding in the woods and made a point to not be seen but to leave an object to be noticed. 
There was no running back with the narrow trail, and I was not about to tell him that we're in potential danger. I told him to go out in front of me, and I just encouraged him basically, and say so we're doing great, over and over, and that speeds him up naturally. I never saw anyone until we were on the trail. We got to the car and I locked the doors immediately. On our way out of the park, a very dirty man, probably in his 30s, came out of the woods and just stares at me, absolutely void of emotions. That man completely follows me until I'm out of sight with his eyes, literally like a serial killer stare. Now, I knew the third fact at that point, that he made a point to make himself apparent and that's the one that kind of scares me the most. That stare actually stuck with me for days and I considered cancelling after that as it bothered me for several weeks causing anxiety. I tried to tell myself that maybe we interrupted his bath time and he didn't want to startle us. After all, he could have just been out there and watching us catching salamanders waiting to go. But I just cannot rationalise why he stared at me like that and wouldn't move. Deep down I know that it was probably a deliberate scare tactic or something. He never had any idea how panicked I was so my boyfriend. It was the most fun that I've ever seen him have. He brings this up on a regular basis as a very positive experience but for me it was not good and I feel very disturbed. This story happened when I was about 15 so many many years ago. Now during the summer I'd been doing quite a lot of house sitting that was for my grandfather's property that he owned out in the middle of nowhere, truly in the backwoods. He literally had neighbours nowhere to be found, and I found that quite interesting. Eventually, he had to move out of there because it was too isolated and living on his own, anything could have happened to him and he would have been miles away from help. I think it would have been quite hard to describe where his property was to anyone that needed to go there in case of emergencies, but I still have fond memories of being there. The property wasn't too big, but it was just enough, and the scenery was beautiful. Now where he lived, it actually had a really nice small lake next to it, and the water was always clear. The trees here were very big too, and very green during the summer, and I guess it was just a beautiful place to go generally. It could get extremely cold in the winter, but we wouldn't go there often during that time. Now on one particular day, my mum and dad were going to take my grandfather out to have a nice meal and whatnot, and they would be gone for most of the day. That meant that I had to do some house sitting. I got some money out of it and I didn't mind, and I was just up for being out there on my own. I was getting to the age where I started to not enjoy living with my parents because I didn't want to be nagged all the time and constantly made to do different things, so I found the whole thing very nice. The main job I had was just to enjoy myself and that's what I did. I arrived to the property and say my goodbyes to my grandfather and my mum and dad and I watched the car slowly peel off with a slight dirt trail behind it. They tell me not to go outside very much because it could be dangerous and I agree but of course I didn't listen. So I head out and immediately I decide to go over to the lake. It was a really nice area that you could sit at and you could even try some fishing but I'd literally never caught anything so I wasn't up for that today. I just took my shoes and socks off and let my feet dip into the water and would just twirl them around and relax. At this time of the year the water wasn't actually that cold too so it was another thing that I really liked. Now I did this for a while and just took in all of the scenery. There was some cloud cover but it wasn't enough that you couldn't get some sunlight on your skin that made you feel all nice and warm. So I was pretty content here. I stayed here for probably about a good hour or so before it started to look like it was going to rain and I decided that I should head back. Now I head back and while walking 
there's some light rainfall which makes me increase my pace, but while walking, I can't get over how beautiful the place is. I didn't feel like I was trapped here, I kind of felt free and very privileged to be able to see everything like this. Now, I'm not too much further from home, and decide to stop. For whatever reason, I just had the feeling that I needed to be out for longer. So I head back the way I come, and luckily the clouds go and it's much more sunny now. I'm walking on this little path that's mostly usable, but there's some large rocks that I have to watch out for. There's one tree that's fallen up ahead of me, but it doesn't bother me, and I continue walking. I remembered thinking that I really wish I had my brother here, or someone that could enjoy it and appreciate it like I did, but he was usually too busy with his girlfriend and he would quite often go off to do his own thing. I learnt later that he actually wanted to do more with me, but I didn't learn that at the time. So I was just here to enjoy it as much as I could. I was also learning to enjoy being on my own and not always need the company of others, but I did kind of miss it. I'd gone quite a long way. It was so much so that I actually become hungry again, and eventually, I decide that I should loop back and just cut this to an end. Now I make my way back inside, and what do you know, I could not have timed it better. As soon as I get in and close the door behind me, I can now hear that it started to rain, and it was kind of nice because it made the whole experience very settling. Now, when I get inside, I do notice something odd. One of grandma's dolls has been left out on the chair. I realise that my grandpa must have done this because it looks quite funny, but it's one that I hadn't realised was there before. It looks quite old and a little bit creepy, but I decide just to leave it there. I can put it away later, and I don't want to get in trouble for doing so right now. Now, I was pretty bored for the first couple of hours and actually drifted off asleep before waking up again. Now, while waking up, I realised that somebody's at the door. They haven't rang the doorbell or anything, but I can just see that somebody's standing there. It looked pretty small and I realised that it's probably a kid there, and I slowly make my way up. I then open the door thinking that it's one of my siblings that my parents have dropped here, and that maybe they've got to see me too, forgetting that I'd fell asleep for a while. I then realise that it's not a person. It's a doll. It's just standing propped up. I realise that it's on a stick and it's got some rocks keeping it in place, but it's just there like it's about to enter. I think this is extremely odd and take a step outside. I look around and can't see anybody, and quickly do a jog around the perimeter. That's when I realise it. There's about 10 doll heads all scattered around the outside of the property, and it gives me chills. I start worrying that my grandpa has something wrong with him that we haven't noticed, and I think, God, the isolation's probably really got to him, and maybe these are his friends, or he thinks they are. But that doesn't explain how the doll got there. I think maybe there's a rational explanation for this, so I just move it to the side with the other doll heads and go back inside. Now, I genuinely completely forgot about them being there, and don't ask me how, because in retrospect, this kind of creeps me out. But I just relax for a while and read a book and get lost in it until I get a call off my parents saying that they're going to have to come over the next day. And how am I doing? I say that's fine and they say there's some really bad traffic so grandpa's just going to stay with them. And again, I've got no issues with this. Now, I eventually go about my evening and go to bed and wake up the next morning. I've really slept for a long time because I wake up and my parents are pulling up on the driveway and I run over and say hello, all excitedly. I ask how their day was and they say it was pretty nice, just took them hours to get back home. And that's when my dad says, what's that? and spots it. I say, I don't know. I didn't know grandpa had this and my grandpa gets out and is equally as confused saying that he doesn't have any and that's not grandma's. I then say, come, come, look, I thought it was really weird yesterday. I thought you did this, Grandpa. 
and originally I thought he was lying, but now there's about 16 doll heads all around outside randomly scattered throughout the property, and my grandpa looks a little bit confused and somewhat angry. At first he thought I'd scattered grandmas around trying to scare them, but I say no I haven't, and I quickly go inside and realise that all of my grandma's three dolls are still there. That's when we realise something's really strange. Why are there doll heads here, and how long have they been there for? My grandpa says that he's certain that he didn't see them the other day when he was doing some yard work, so that poses a question. Who put them there and why? We search around the property and actually go quite far. I ended up going off closer to the lake again, trying to look for anything. Another doll or a person, but I can't find anyone. I eventually head back and my mum starts really panicking. I then explain that one of them was on the chair, and that's enough. My mum quickly gets all my stuff and my grandpa's stuff too that he needs, and she says that he's going to stay with us for a while. We quickly search around inside the property and can't see anything, and we lock up everything, and I watch the house slowly disappear in the distance. Now it took another good three or four months before eventually my grandpa went back there, and that was without incident. My dad had collected all of the doll heads into a trash bag and disposed of them. Turns out we never got to the bottom of what actually happened that day, and sometimes I still have nightmares about seeing those doll heads. Now, I've always been interested in the paranormal and unexplained ever since I was a young kid, after having what I now believe to be an experience with a black eyed kid, but that's a story for another day. This one takes place when I was about 15 or so in the middle of Tennessee. Back then, I was going through my edgy phase, as we all do, and I thought it would be cool to go into the woods alone to blow off some steam and why not. I spent a lot of time with my grandma as my dad worked six days a week and I didn't feel comfortable being left alone at home since it was kind of a sketchy meth head town, whereas my grandma lived in a relatively nicer area. She owns a good few acres of land and if you go far enough into the woods, there's this really beautiful waterfall that leads to an underground spring. So one day, I was going back there trekking the land I knew like the back of my hand at that point, enjoying the peacefulness and wilderness and everything it has to offer. After going uphill for a bit, it starts downhill and there's this clearing that takes you straight to the waterfall. Watching my feet as I walk, always cautious as to not step on a hopper head, I came down the hill into a clearing. Right at the bottom of the hill, I see something. It's unusual and catches my eye. It took me a second to realise what I was staring at, but it was the skeleton of a deer, like freshly killed. Now normally I wouldn't think too much of this, but something felt off. There was no rotten skin or signs of flesh anywhere. These bones still had flesh and blood on them, but no signs of skin or anything. My young teenage mind tried to process this and I couldn't think of any predator in that area that could have just stripped a deer like this. The other thing is, no hunter would really be able to do this. Now, this is not an area where hunters are known to hunt to, already supposed to be. The moment I realise this, a very strong sense of doom washes over me, and it's almost an impending one and my fight or flight kicked in. It felt like the trees and everything around me was shaking, like something was moving fast towards me, so I took off and ran as fast as I can not even looking behind me, because I can sense I'm being chased. I hear the twigs and sticks breaking under the weight of something behind me. It sounds heavy too. I don't think I ever ran so quick in my life. Once I'm out of the woods, I make it back to roughly where my grandma's is, and get into the backyard and suddenly a feeling of safety washes over me. I don't know what was in those woods that day, but needless to say, I didn't hike back there or go back there on my own ever again.
In the late 90s, when I was about 12 years old, I went to a summer camp at Robbers Cave in Oklahoma. Our cabin was filled with bunk beds in big open space, so I had a top bunk. One of the nights I was there, I woke up suddenly in the middle of the night to a sound outside of my window. My head lay opposite from the window, so when I sat up, I was staring directly outside into the woods. Through the grass, I see a glowing green object in the shape of a person. I couldn't see a face, but I could feel it staring at me. The ordeal lasted for what felt like a minute of us staring at each other. I remembered I began feeling sick to my stomach and the next thing I remember was waking up the following day. I've tried as rationally as I can to figure out what it was or think maybe it was a dream, but it really felt different to me and was too vivid. The experience was so jarring that I've had recurring dreams about seeing this thing ever since, but for whatever reason, none of them feel like that first one that I had. Now I grew up on a ranch. My dad owned a small single wide trailer. We were neighbours with my Tia and Tio. They were around 100 yards to the left of us. The back of our trailer was placed really close to thick woods, so I didn't really have a backyard. We were kind of plopped right in the middle of the woods, but our driveway was connected to the main dirt road if that makes sense. Well, I always felt creeped out about the backyard area and our back door. Like I said, we didn't have a backyard. It was a heavy, uncleared wooded area. We never used the back door. It was always locked with one of those chain locks on the inside. I was a very active kid. I couldn't ever sit inside and chill. I always had to be outside exploring. Usually my cousins and I would explore the ranch, build forts and ride four wheelers, but there were times that I would go exploring alone. I remembered there was one time I was looking around the trailer alone trying to find a good spot to build a fort. I was around 8 years old at the time. I went to the end of the trailer to explore. This area had a large area of cleared brush, but behind me was the backwood area. Now I can remember walking around focusing on finding a good sport spot when suddenly, I feel really uneasy. My attention immediately went to the backwood area. It felt like someone was staring at me. The feeling was so intense. I booked it to the back of my house. I don't remember any other details about that experience other than feeling like somebody was there staring at me. There was another time where I came home from my cousin's house to get some clothes since I was staying the night with her. So it's around 9pm. My cousin's driveway connects to the main dirt road in the same area as my driveway. Anyway. When I opened the front door and walk into the trailer, I noticed the back door was completely open, again. I was staying at my cousin's house and my dad was down the road at a local bar. There was no one at the trailer for hours. My dad never opened the back door ever for any reason. I immediately felt very spooked and hightailed it back to my cousin's house without getting the clothes I initially went there to pick up. There's many other weird things that my cousins and I have experienced on the ranch, but this experience is by far the most alarming for us. It was during the summer of 07. We were at my cousin's house. My dad took us to Hollywood Video earlier that day to rent a movie. This was what he did to make up for being out late. Now, we ended up renting Texas Chainsaw Massacre and decided to watch it at about 1am. We chose to rent this movie and watched it at a time because we loved to get spooked. Well, after finishing the movie, it's about 2am and we still want to party so we decide that we'll walk to my trailer and pick up the boombox and listen to our CDs we just burnt on a website. Remember. 
My cousin's driveway is connected to the main road parallel to where my driveway was. We get to walk in and out of nowhere, we hear a chainsaw going off in the hill about 40 or 50 yards to the left of us. Way too close for comfort. Again, this is 2am in the middle of nowhere. All of the land surrounding us is owned by a close family. None of them would ever opt to clear slash operate a chainsaw at 2am in the pitch black. We actually have to use a flashlight to see the dirt road in front of us, that's how dark it was. When we heard the chainsaw, we all paused and looked at each other super confused. Once we processed what we're hearing, we run as fast as we can to my trailer, only because at that point, it was closer than my cousin's house. Unfortunately, my dad wasn't home. He was out doing whatever he was doing, so we couldn't tell him about what we just heard or ask for a ride back to the cousins. We ended up grabbing my loaded .22 and walking back with it in hand. Luckily, we didn't hear the chainsaw again. Now, to this day, my cousins and I are perplexed over this experience. There's no logical explanation to this chainsaw that we heard at 2am. In a weird way, it almost sounded like a very loud recording of a chainsaw, rather than an actual chainsaw. Again, none of my family would wake up at 2am and start clearing, or doing anything, so... It's weird, or why would they play the sound of one for no reason? And I feel especially weirded out because we'd just watched the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Even though we were trying to get spooked, we didn't want it to be in this way. None of us are expecting what we heard. We all heard it clear as day at the same time. My cousins and I told our family about this experience on a few occasions. My family's response is always weird. My dad got short with us and said, well, you shouldn't have been out at that time. Now, I don't really know what to think of it. Now, my father grew up in rural Idaho in the 70s and 80s and the ranch is surrounded by about a thousand acres where he has no neighbors. Now, one night, my grandparents left my father and his foster brother home alone while they attended an event in a larger city. Usually this is fine, the house is miles away from the road, so visitors were always expected and known in advance. It wasn't the sort of place that strangers happened upon. My dad was walking down the hall and happened to pass the back door, which has a large window directly next to it. He was horrified to see a man's face pressed against it and staring at him. He didn't recognize the man, then he and the man actually stare at each other. Now, eventually the man moved away, my dad screams for his brother, and the both of them run upstairs to the front door. The front door is large and a sliding glass door that overlooks the driveway. In the driveway was an unfamiliar car with headlights on parked. Feeling trapped, they decide to call the closest neighbor they can think of. The neighbor agreed to come and check out the place and they sat and watched the car park. And though they never saw anybody getting in or out of one, they watched the car that's there slowly drive and go away. Now, there are two bumpy dirt lanes that lead in and out of our ranch. One running north and the other south, they're both about a mile long. The neighbor that had seen the car had arrived from the south only a few minutes after the car pulled away, and the grandparents actually arrived from the north about the same time. Neither had passed the same car, or even seen a man walking around. In the years since, almost all my family has seen the car driving around the ranch, and few people have ever seen the man press his face against a window. Now, we have no idea who he is, though. I grew up in a property that was really out of the way. It was literally like an hour drive just to find your next neighbour, and that had some advantages as well as some downsides. 
The problem was that if you didn't have a car, you're kind of stranded. And normally, my parents would always have a babysitter whenever I was out. But at the time of this story, I was grown enough and trusted that yes, I could be in the property on my own if they needed to go out and do things. And I was a teenager, so I was more rebellious then. My father owned a rifle and I knew exactly where it was and how to open it with the key, so I always felt safe. Don't worry, I was trained by him and I knew all of the safety stuff and I always thought of that if ever I went near that thing. Now on one particular day, my parents were going out for the evening. This was before cell phones, so I couldn't have called them if I needed to too directly, but I knew that they had a landline that I could answer to, and I wasn't too worried really. They said that they're going to call around 10 at night just to check up on me before coming home at around 11. So I say goodbye, and I'm really happy here. It was kind of like one of those nostalgic summer days you remember when you're a kid when you feel like you have all the time in the world to be at home and just do what you want so I decided to go for a quick wander through the woods. I felt very happy and I really enjoyed the fact that my parents were, yes, finally letting me do things as I wanted. It wasn't always as quick as I might have liked but I didn't have a problem with it. I had some cool drinks with me as well that I'd bought from the store the other day with my dad. My dad said that I could treat myself and could also order pizza, so I was really happy. I had about $20 or so saved up and I was looking forward to using it. Before my dad left, he told me that I could use his own money so it made it even better. I ended up going through the woods for a while and I didn't see anyone. I never did really. I wasn't even on a proper path, I just knew the area well, so enjoyed wandering around here. There was one kind of gate that you had to go through, which is owned by farmers, but there weren't any there at the time. I make my way down to the area that I like to sit at, which is near some abandoned railway tracks. Long ago the trains come here, and long ago were any other people. So that's why I'm a bit confused. As I'm laying down, I'm sure I can see something white just further up ahead. I didn't know what I was seeing. It kind of looked like when you see spots in your eyes and they glow too brightly. Because I only saw it for a second but it disappeared. I thought that was pretty odd and actually ended up standing up and kind of covering my eyes to see as much as I can. You know how if you kind of make like binoculars with your hands you can focus a bit? I was doing that but it didn't seem to make much of a difference because I couldn't see anything. I presume that yes, I'm not seeing anything and decide that I should just head back now. It was a given that I was footing on a front, but I was feeling a lot less confident than when I walked in here. Not to worry, I just played some of my favourite songs and headed out. Jump over the gate and head back to home. Now I eventually get back in and I feel pretty happy and content. I go to raid the fridge of some of the cool drinks that I had and I have them all in one. I realise, oh, this is a bad decision because I wanted to save some to have with the pizza. So I just put the TV on to distract myself. Now I had it on pretty loudly and that's when I don't notice it at first. There's some kind of knocking come in. I quickly get up and go towards the door. I think maybe my parents have come home early, so I open it and say, Hey, Dad. Kind of annoyed, but I realise no one's around. I can just hear the sounds of the TV in the background, so I just think that maybe it was on the TV and closed the door. I head back inside and turn down the TV a little bit and order the pizza. They inform me that there's problems with the line and that they can't understand what I'm saying to make the order, and I keep saying, No, please. I just need one large chicken pizza, again and again until eventually they hang up on me. Annoyed I hang up my phone too actually slamming it down, really irritated because I can make my own food but who wants to do that? I think there's better things that I can be doing with my time so I go back to watching TV. Still irritated with the pizza place I put it on a little louder than before. Now I get lost in the show that I'm watching and kind of half fall asleep. 
I'm awoken again by knocking again, and I'm convinced that it's my parents at home. I quickly get up and peer around the window, but I can't see anyone or anything. Again, this is pretty bizarre, but I try not to get too bothered by it, and just look at the time quickly, thinking maybe my parents have gone round to close the window or something. That's when I realise that it's only been about 10 minutes, and it's way too early for my parents to be back. I'm pretty tired now, but kind of orientate myself again, and decide to turn off the TV. I decide that I'm going to do some reading of some of my comic books now, because I've got all of the things at my disposal that I want to do. So I go and grab one, this time moving over to the kitchen. I start reading through them, and I have a feeling that there's something on the back of my neck. I keep trying to reach for it, but I can't seem to figure out what it is. At first I thought maybe it was like a spider's web that had fell onto me, or something like a hair, but I realise there's nothing there, and I also feel much more warm than earlier. Again, this is a pretty bizarre one, and I can't really figure out what it is, and I just kind of hope that my mum and dad come back quicker. I go to the phone to try and make a phone call to my parents asking how long they're going to be. So I pick up the phone and I realise that the line is down. I can just hear a constant buzzing sound. I actually disconnect and reconnect it and keep on picking it up and down but it doesn't make a difference. The line is absolutely funked. I think god this can't get any worse. To be honest, I was going to re-attempt to buy pizza afterwards too, so I was getting annoyed. I decide instead that I should go and make a sandwich now. I make it back to the kitchen and make myself a sandwich. I go back to watch some more TV, and you're probably getting tired of hearing this now, but it was one of my absolute favourite things to do. I'd love to say it was a big learning experience, but it wasn't. But hey, I was young, so it was a thing to do. Now while watching TV this time, I notice there's something, and it doesn't bother me at all at first. Don't ask me why, but I was probably too engrossed in what I was watching. I realise that there's a figure on the patio which doesn't look right. I can kind of just see it out of my eye, until I turn around and we lock eyes. I'm now staring face to face with someone who is freakishly tall dressed in a clown costume holding a knife. I don't know what to do, and we're froze locking eyes for what feels like a good 20 seconds or so, but it was probably only about 2 or 3. I realise that I've dropped my sandwich as I was eating, and my limbs have all went limp. I go to scream but nothing comes out of my mouth. For a second I considered that it was my parents and maybe they thought it was funny, but I realise it's not possible. This person is much taller than my dad. Now to describe this person, they look like they're in their 50s or 60s, caked in clown makeup, wearing a typical clown uniform, mostly dressed in yellow. I go to scream again and nothing comes out when the clown slowly raises its hand up and starts waving back and forth to me. The clown then gestures to be quiet as it slowly walks round to the other side of the house out of sight, still clutching what I think is a knife. Now I did scream finally, and I actually scared myself with the tone of it. Almost on instinct, I rush over to where the gun is stored, I go to grab the key, and I can't find it. I punch the side and actually hurt my hand, but somehow this opened it. I thank god under my breath and I quickly grab the rifle. My hands are shaking so much that I can't actually load it properly and ended up cutting my hand which I'd already injured hitting this thing open, trying to put some ammo in. But that doesn't matter, I have lots of adrenaline now. I don't know where this clown is and for some reason I decide the best thing I can do is open the window and start letting some shots off. Now I could have very easily killed someone because I wasn't aiming, but I wasn't really thinking of that. I mean god I could have even hit my parents but it's not worth thinking of. And I let out four shots outside the window. 
Now, this must have been enough to scare whoever that person is because I go lurching window to window with my rifle in hand like some kind of spec op soldier and I don't see anyone. Now, I try again to call the police, call anyone but the phone line's still down. I realise that all I can do now is just wait it out and I quickly arm myself with all the ammo there is and go to the bathroom locking the door. From here I have a point of view where I can see if my parents have come home or not. I just cock one in the chamber and wait there patiently. Now my god I thought it was about 6 hours but it was probably only about 2 before I eventually see some lights coming up the drive and I realise that it's my parents. I scream mom dad come. My dad quickly sprints out of the car and my mom's just behind them and I rush to open the door of the bathroom and sprint down. I bolt there and my dad says, Jesus, why have you got that? And takes the gun off me, quickly putting a safety on. I then explain that somebody's here and my dad looks furious, flicks off the safety and goes room to room searching. He searches the entire house and even around the perimeter when he realizes that somebody's cut the phone line. My mum is very scared and all of us get into the car, only once my dad is certain that no one's here. My dad's asking me to describe the person and a look of absolute terror comes across him when I describe this person was wearing a clown outfit. I guess he had seen that killer from back in the day and maybe he thought it was someone inspired by them. I don't know, but eventually my dad gets over to the police station, screaming the whole time that he's going to kill this person, he's going to kill them. Eventually, my dad puts the rifle down into the car because obviously he doesn't want to go into the police station like that. And we end up saying exactly what's happened. My mum's very shaken and we actually have to stay in a motel room for a number of months afterwards. My parents are not able to sell the property, but my mum also got a gun and I got my very own one after this. We were also never allowed to stay in there individually unless it was my dad on his own, but he never did that. We never found out who this is or what their intentions were, but unfortunately there wasn't enough forensics from where the line was cut. It's one experience that stayed with me and I think I'm never going to be able to lose it from my mind. I'm just incredibly grateful that I didn't freeze up and God knows what would have happened to me if that had happened. Me and my family went on a short road trip a number of years ago. The time of this event was actually in the 1980s, so a good while before you had decent cell phones. We also didn't really have much in the way of satellite navigation back then, so it meant you basically had to rely on maps and that wasn't always so easy. It was my dad, my brother and I on this particular journey and me and my brother were acting as key navigators for my father. Now, to say that didn't go well would be an understatement because we ended up miles and miles away from where we're supposed to be. And we basically ended up changing the place that we were going to camp at, just to make things easier. My dad wasn't that bothered though, and we settled into the area that we can park and camp. We did originally plan on setting up our tents, but it was quite late and we just settled down. We're figuring out what we need to do and my dad suggests that we still make it to the other place because it was close to a beautiful national park and there was going to be lots we could see. We all agree with this and we settle in for the night. Nothing much happened, I just had a feeling that I couldn't sleep easily. When we woke up, someone who was dressed in a hat come over to us. It was clearly a park ranger who said something pretty weird to us. He said, hey, I'm going to have to kick you out of here. We said, oh, sorry, we didn't realise this was somewhere we couldn't park or stay. And he said, no, just you're not supposed to be here. Something about this person seemed really odd. And my dad gave him a funny look and quickly ushered us to get our things ready and drive away. Now, on the drive back, me and my brother kept asking my dad what was wrong and why he looked a bit unsettled, and he then said that there aren't supposed to be any park rangers out here. I thought that was pretty bizarre, but I thought, you know, maybe they've just expanded somewhere and we didn't realise it. I was pretty paranoid, 
because, I don't know, I was young, but my dad seemed worse than me. And that was a bit worrying because my dad's a pretty strong person and I've never really seen him worry much before. Eventually though, we start making our way to where we're actually supposed to be originally. I don't know, it was kind of a good thing that we got there because I didn't want to spend another night in that place. You know when you feel like somebody's just going to linger around for a stupidly long time for no reason? Yeah, I kind of had the feeling that that was going to happen again. Now, to say this trip was eventful would be an understatement, as you're about to hear. Now, we eventually get to this place, and my god, it's beautiful. I've seen some pretty good things in my time, but not much can compare to how beautiful this place was and where dad took us. I was really grateful for it, and I found it a really nice adventure to have. I thought it was really funny what had happened earlier, and my dad actually settled up a lot, and we start to feel pretty good. So eventually we set up our tent and get ready to sleep. That was when it happened. We hear some screaming, and it was really creepy. I don't know whether there was some kind of animals getting into some big fire outside, but that's what it sounded like. Until eventually, it sounds just like there was some kind of human intervention. My dad says to wait here as he goes outside the tent, and I can hear him talking to someone. The screaming sounds have stopped, and I think this is pretty bizarre, because my god did it sound like there was all hellfire earlier, so what happened? Me and my brother slowly emerged. I remembered it was very cold outside, and my dad was saying to someone, no, just go away, and actually swearing. That's when I realised, it was the same ranger that we had seen before. How on God's green earth had this person managed to get to the exact same spot as us again? It's not possible, I said to my brother and thought that maybe it was someone who just looked very similar, but this guy sounded exactly the same. Eventually this guy scurried off and my dad said something about being armed to him, and that seemed to make this person change their tone. They just slowly disappear into the trees like they weren't there before. Another weird thing that I noticed is that this person looks very tired and sweaty, almost like they've been in some kind of big fight, but with who? With what? That we just didn't know. Now discussing it the next morning wasn't really an option because my dad was really focused in. From early in the morning he'd gone round with his knife and was just patrolling the perimeter like he was looking for something. Me and my brother then say, Dad, what are you doing? And he just shakes his head and says, no, something's just off with that guy and I don't know why. I just can't stop thinking about it. We eventually all agree that we should move our campsite because we don't want to have our trip ruined by some weirdo, but it was really looking that way. So we now go a bit deeper into the woods. We eventually find another really safe place to go, and it's pretty cool. It's kind of up on a hill and you have a good vantage point here, so we're feeling a lot safer now, and we go about our day like usual. We've set up the tent and are getting ready for this night's sleep too. We're not too far from the end of our trip now, and we were actually enjoying it. However, this one particular night, my dad just would not fall asleep. Eventually, me and my brother do though. We wake up the next morning, and my dad looks like he hasn't had any sleep at all. I say, Dad, what's wrong? And he says, well, nothing. We then keep on pressing him to find out what had happened, and again, he doesn't say anything at first, until eventually, he finally lets off on what happened. Apparently, all night, he was sure that he could see the silhouette of someone who appeared to be dressed just like a park ranger, and it scared my dad a lot. We decide that we're going to man out the last night because again we're armed and we're at quite a good point here but something just felt off about this person. So anyway, what happens? We go to fall asleep the next day and here we are again. Blood curdling screams that you cannot seem to get away from and it's really annoying because clearly this is some kind of animal out here and it will not stop making these weird sounds. But then again, we didn't really consider the fact that maybe just maybe this was people going at it and maybe trying to kill each other. Well, at least that's what my dad said. Every time we raised the alarm, he said, no, no, don't, don't worry, just go to sleep. If anyone comes, I'll get them with my life. 
Now that reassured us a lot and we fall asleep again. Now everything's as it should be the next morning and we get our things together and decide to go. However, while leaving, we do realise something odd. There's blood, and a lot of it. It's only about a four minute walk from our tent, but it almost looks like somebody's had a massive sword fight. No, multiple people have had a big sword fight like back in the day. But where are the bodies? The amount of blood on the floor is honestly inhuman, and there must have been at least one or two morbities. But nobody's around. And the smell, it smelled so bad. Honestly, like something we've never smelt before. And you can imagine we didn't stick around too long for this. My dad intelligently mentions that if this is what he thinks it is, then we don't want to put our forensics there. Forensics wasn't very advanced back then, but we weren't silly and keep it moving. My dad then goes over to the station to report what's happened, and that's when we see it. All kinds of police cars everywhere, and some law enforcement's coming to approach us. They tell us not to move and we don't, and my dad goes over to talk to them. I don't know exactly what he said, but they actually come and cuff him and us and we have to go in to give some statements. They don't let on to exactly what's happened, but they just ask exactly why we're out there and what we're doing. Again, I didn't realise this until afterwards, but they actually interviewed all of us independently to make sure that our stories matched up. They asked for the exact spot where we camped and my dad eventually leads them over there. Me and my brother have to stay with the police who will not tell us what happened. Eventually though after persisting one of them opens up and says you know they found a few bodies out there? Me and my brother look at each other terrified now. It was almost like we didn't want to accept that we'd just walk through a crime scene but that was exactly what had happened. Apparently, there were reports of somebody imitating some kind of law enforcement or something, following people around, then getting them in the night. And apparently, this wasn't the first time that it had happened out here. Now, my dad comes back after a while and says, come on, let's go. None of us said a word to each other, as the police open up their tape and let us through. Now, the drive back was pretty much entirely in silence until we pull off on the driveway and my dad looks me and my brother dead in the eyes and tells us, Hey, you don't tell anyone about what happened, alright? Especially not your mother. And we both agree with this, and that's that. So after doing some research later, it turns out that somebody would dress up like a police or park ranger and just try and look official in order to follow people around, and this person actually ended up murdering almost four people. It turned out we were camping in basically the exact spot where one of the murders took place and there's a pretty strong chance that he was actually following us but we were the lucky ones who got away. It still terrifies me, I mean, I don't think I'll ever get over this. In December of 2005, me and a few high school friends were back home from our respective universities. We were juniors at the time and started a tradition winter break of freshman year to visit random state parks slash smaller towns and explore them, along with the occasional mischief that we would end up getting ourselves into. During these times, one night trips, the three of us would all sleep in the back of my Tahoe on a large mattress pad. This kept us safe from the elements and set my paranoid mind at ease should we be subject to any foul play. We decided this year to go to the Davy Crockett National Forest area. This area has many places that are extremely rural and desolate, which was exciting because we had previously found some interesting things and in abandoned structures on our previous excursions. I had used up the rest of my university printing credits to print detailed map quest pages for us to navigate while we were visiting. The drive was roughly two hours from our hometown, Conroe. We decided to start the trip off in Lufkin, just east of the National Forest, to eat dinner and get a few things from Walmart. After dinner, we decided to mess around and get into our shenanigans. A few hours later, we found ourselves in Crockett, Texas, about an hour west of Lufkin. 
We planned on staying in a campground about halfway between the two cities, so had a lot of flexibility when it came time. We explored random roads and went in a few abandoned buildings before getting bored and wanting to go somewhere else. By this time, it was 12.30am and at this point, I needed to get an energy boost. So, we decided to stop at a gas station in Kennard, Texas, which was about 30 minutes east of Crockett. I go inside and buy a few snacks, energy drinks and a few cans of Skull to give us some fuel for the rest of the night, which is giving me a nice buzz. We decide to go a little more adventurous and venture down FM 357, south of Kennard. We come across a few forest service roads that veered off into rural residential roads and other country roads. I pull off on the side of the road to check the map quest and match the cross streets we're on at any given moment with my two friends assisting the navigation. After getting back onto the road, I notice it's 1.30am and we all joke about how miraculously that we're still up. I decide to head down to the next service road we come across. This is where things start to get pretty weird and where parts of my memory are erased due to sheer adrenaline that I had at the time. After driving down a few more service roads and taking random turns, we go to a road that is much more narrow compared to the others. By this time, I get incredibly frustrated. I mean, it's almost 2.15am and I don't want to stumble into someone's front yard in a rural area in the middle of the night. I decide to slow down and suddenly, I noticed a faint light in the distance. Great, just great. I think. I thought about the chance of spooking some random soul awake, but about 30 seconds later, I can tell that these are headlights, but they suddenly disappeared. I thought somebody may have turned up ahead, but I was very wrong. About 10 to 15 seconds later, I see what appeared to be a brand new Chevy Suburban. The second I put my high beams on, it's light turned on and three men dressed in suits jump out and sprint down the road past my car. It was almost like they were lifeless and didn't even notice me. As they're running past me, the Suburban suddenly shifts into reverse and conducts the fastest reverse manoeuvre I've ever seen. At this point, I unholster my G26 and tell my friend to grab my AR. We're all terrified and have no clue what we're about to come upon. As we drove forward, mind you, these were the days where cell phone coverage was literally non-existent in many areas of this state, so we had no way to call for help if anything happened. As we reach the end of the road, we come upon FM 357, the same road we originated from. But how is this possible, I thought. It felt like we're just venturing further and further away from the road. And we passed a US Forest Service fire station again on the way out like we had on the way in. I've recently checked Google Maps for any US Forest Service fire station off of FM 357 and can't find any current or past historical data for that. The county tax assessor does not have any listings either. We got back on the FM 357 and decided to book it downtown Crockett as we did not feel comfortable with sleeping in a campsite after what just happened. I have since made sure to never venture down any unknown roads whatsoever without at least referencing the GPS or map. I'm still processing that short but unsettling event. Where did those men come from? Why were they in suits in the middle of the forest and where did the black suburban go? Me and my friends actually still occasionally talk about the incident and no one can come up with an explanation for what happened. The thing that bothers me is that I cannot find any evidence of this road that we're on. Google Earth doesn't have a satellite or any kind of image which lines up with the one that we're on so this one and truly deepens the mystery of it all. So. This happened in 1989. I was with my boyfriend Eddie, his best friend. 
my older sister, Angie, and about six other people. We had spent the entire day mudding in the Royal Palm mudflats in Royal Palm Beach, Florida, aka the part of the Palm Beach County. I grew up in West Palm Beach. I had never seen anything like this before. After mudding all day, we decided to call it a night and leave. Almost everybody was gone by then, so we all piled into Eddie's truck and left. Eddie saw a small mud hole and drove through it, and we got stuck. The small hole was relatively deceptive. When I say we got stuck, I mean stuck for hours. I was pregnant with my first, so I was steering as the other niner pushed in. The truck didn't budge. We had no choice but to wait until the morning for someone to come and tow us as we now completely stuck. It's about 5am, we decide we should just relax and try to sleep until someone come through. Eddie, I and his best friends are in front. My sister and other six who we are still friends to this day pile into the back and start to settle down. We were still making noise when I heard a sound. It was a low grumble. I knew immediately that it was some kind of animal. I tell everyone to hush and listen. Then, we all heard it, and it was getting louder and louder and more aggressive sounding now. Eddie has a KC light in his back seat, so he popped it out and lit up the night. That's when our world changed. Ten of us all see something ducking down and moving. Everyone was freaking out because it was clearly there. But what was it? Then it got annoyed and this thing stood up and let out a roar that I can still remember 31 years later. It leapt through the large brush that it was hiding behind, coming straight towards us and you can literally feel the shake with every footstep it took. It was 8 to 9 feet tall and broad. It looked like an extremely large man with hair, not fur, it had hair and lots of it. The KC lit it up and you could see it clumping on the hair. The smell was rotten and sour and being pregnant I was extremely sensitive to smell so it was bad. We had spent hours, we're talking 5 plus hours trying to push this truck out. They say adrenaline gives you super strength and they're right. Eddie turned on his truck and starts pushing on the door frame. His bestie leapt out of his side and did the same. My sister and the others let out screams as they piled out, and then all you hear is this thing running and roaring. Everybody else was dead silent as they put everything they needed back and start pushing. With a sucking pop, that's all I can describe it as, we're out and we're throwing ourselves into the back as Eddie and his bestie just floor it. This is woods with tight turns and we literally flew around those. It felt like the devil himself was after us. After we got out and onto the main road, we headed for a gas station to calm down and call our families. When we got there, we all got out, sat with our backs to the wall and that was it. We never said a word to each other, just sitting there in silence. I think we were too raw, scared and in complete shock over what had happened. This was law. This wasn't real, so why did it exist because it was there? Anyway, after we called our parents and went home, one by one being dropped off, not a word was spoken. My sister and I did not discuss it until about five years ago and we finally opened up about it and two others. It's kind of burned into my memory and I don't know what it is but it looked just like a Bigfoot. I was going on a road trip with my brother. I hadn't done so before and we were both very excited to be doing so. We were going to drive across a few different states and for that I was very excited. The destination was eventually getting to Canada and that was really the highlight of the trip. We had such a good time when we eventually make it there, but however, during the trip there, there was one particular event that I don't think I'm ever going to forget. 
Now let me set the scene. We've been driving for quite a long time, and we didn't come across anywhere to fill up on gas. We also needed to get some more food and thing. I mean, we had enough of, as you say, proper food, but we wanted to get more snacks and stuff, and we're both getting a little bit tired. Now both of us are pretty good drivers, and we didn't have an issue driving, even if we're a little sleepy, but as you know, that can be quite dangerous. So, we eventually find a gas station that looks pretty good, and we pull over there. We fill up on some gas, and we go inside the store and pay for the gas. We also look around and start getting some snacks and things, and... I don't know why, the guy at the counter just felt pretty weird. He seemed nice enough at first, but for some reason, as soon as he heard we're out of town, he kind of changed and just stared at us. It was almost like it wasn't a real person and it was some kind of NPC put there. I don't know how to describe it, but the whole thing just felt a bit surreal. We eventually get the snacks as well and leave and tell him to keep the change, thinking maybe that'll make him more happy, but he literally doesn't react at all. We eventually make it back out, and my brother says, Oh, I really need to use a bathroom, and quickly heads back. I say that I'm gonna wait, and he goes in the store, and this is what he tells me. Apparently the guy was staring at him the whole time back in, and didn't say hello or anything when he re-entered. He said that he really needed to use a bathroom, and the guy said he'd show him, and apparently he led him to some really dodgy back area. And it looked like he was going to be trapped, and he said, yeah, the light's next to the toilet, you'll find it, and went and closed the door. My brother said that he just stood there completely bewildered and confused about what had happened, and he knew he wasn't going to go there. He felt like he was being set up. What's worst is he can quietly hear the door being locked behind him. Rather than panic him, my brother rather smartly went through an open window and come back to me. He quickly gets in and says, hey, let's just get driving. Now, we probably only went about a minute further down the road before the sky lights up a bit brighter. And then, a few seconds later, we're hit with a very loud explosion sound, and it makes me almost crash into a tree. We both look at each other confused as to what's happening, and honestly, we thought that there was some kind of foreign force invading our country. After a number of minutes, we managed to settle down and realise that this isn't the case. Now, we decide that we're going to slowly head back and see what happened, and we're hit with how dark it is. We didn't have to turn around for long before we can see the burning embers where the gas station was. Thinking that guy's just blew himself to pieces in some kind of accident, we frantically call for the cops. We pull over and get out and decide that we need to go and see if he's okay, and that's when we see him. We can see the silhouette of him standing, staring into the flames about 30 meters ahead of us. We both look at each other and slowly make it back to the car and start driving. We drove for another good five hours before eventually stopping, and we don't know what to make of it. Even to this day, we don't know whether that guy was setting up to kill my brother for whatever reason, but I just thank God that he managed to get out in one piece.